Are lectures dead? Should they be dead? No, definitely not. Make the case for lectures for me. They seem old fashioned, especially now. They do. And I get, you know, I guess it's been given a particular currency because of lockdown and the fact that we haven't actually been able to give lectures and the fact that we actually finished up our teaching for this academic year online uh, because it was all we could do. But actually, the discussion's been going on a lot longer than that. And what's really precipitated it was the prevalence of lecture capture, the fact that lecture capture is happening, that, that we're basically videoing and recording all our lectures and making them available to students. And so then the obvious question you ask is, well, what, what's the point in being at the lecture? You know, why don't I just listen to the lecture capture? Um, and certainly my view is that they are not in any way interchangeable. I was actually for a very long time quite strongly opposed to doing lecture capture. Um, I'll get to why in a moment, but I'll tell you what changed my mind first. What changed my mind was I got an email from a very dyslexic student. We were actually required to do it, so I started doing it. And I got an email from a very dyslexic student with this kind of very profuse thanks for doing it because he he made a very strong case that it had completely revolutionised the way he could learn things, that he could now stop the lecture at the point where he needed to. If there was something he was stuck on, he could just go through it you know, 17 times until he'd actually understood what it was he was trying to understand. And it was just, a, for him, a completely different experience learning-wise from what he was getting out of lectures. At that point, I was kind of won over, at least to the principle of, of making lectures available this way. But I still have sort of reservations, and they go back to why I was originally opposed to it, which is that it's pretty clear that the experience of being in a lecture is completely different from the experience of watching a YouTube video. Um if you go to a lecture, you know, if it's a nine o'clock lecture, you've made a particular effort to be there. You've kind of, you know, committed to going there. You're sitting there for an hour. There are no other distractions. You're surrounded by a whole bunch of other students who are all focused on what's going on in the lecture. So actually, you know, it really kind of is going to be a completely different experience from watching a YouTube video while you're doing three other things at the same time, making yourself a cheese toasty uh, and chatting to your mates. And so... You know, it, because it is that completely different experience, I've quite quite strongly been of the view that actually learning things from a lecture is a different experience than from learning them from watching videos and other other media. So it's the ritual of attendance. It's partly the ritual. It's partly the peer thing of being surrounded by other people. It's partly the commitment that you've made for being there. It's partly performance, actually. It's you know, it's it really is you know a good lecturer is actually a storyteller. And they're telling you a story. I mean, the, the argument, you know, why do we bother with lectures really shouldn't have started with the introduction of YouTube, right? You could ask exactly the same question as soon as the book was invented, right? You know, why are we bothering with lectures when you could perfectly well read it out of a book? And it's clear being told a story about something is very different from figuring it out from yourself or just, you know, reading it out of a book or even to a lesser extent watching it on a video. So I think that actually there is an aspect to, to lecturing which is fundamentally different from learning through other media like watching online clips or reading it out of a book. Mike, you, you talk about the fact that students at a lecture pay attention more rather than making a cheese toasty or, you know, doing their email. Do they pay attention though? Are they just turning up because they have to be ticked off a list? Are they paying attention to your lecture these days? Uh, I, I mean, they don't have to be there, right? And, you know, nothing bad happens to them if they don't turn up. I mean, you know, we'll ask why they weren't there. But actually, you know, we don't kick them out of the university or anything like that. It really is, you know, you just want a little bit of pressure to get people to go to the lecture. Then they bother to attend and they get all the benefits that come from actually being in the lecture. It, uh, you make a good point about, you know, books could have put lectures out of business. But there just seems to be so much technology and so many more ways to communicate and tell stories and refine the telling of a story that a lecture does seem old fashioned, that it has to be this set amount of time every time you talk about, you know, some a lot of lecturers aren't good lecturers. I've sat through some pretty bad lectures like and there's and, and there's no way to improve it or edit it or fix it if it's just being done live. I guess, that, I mean, there's an element of that, but actually, in some ways, you hit on what the other part of the problem is, or at least another part of the problem, which is there are just so many ways to learn now that there's, it's very hard for there to be any structure to that learning. It's really important when you're learning that there's a, a reasonable amount of structure imposed on what you're doing, um, that you're learning things in the right order, that you're learning them from the right resources in a consistent way, that everything sort of fits together with everything else. And the nice thing about the structure of a lecture is that that's sort of built into it, right? That actually the lecture has all that, has that flow to it. It's sort of done in a very 
sort of consistent way. Whereas if you're just dipping into, you know, this resource and that resource, it's very hard to get that kind of structured learning, which is an important part of the, the, the learning process. It is something we're going to have to address because it's pretty clear for the coming year. You know, we're not giving conventional lectures in the coming year. We're looking at how we can take what we teach and split it up into smaller chunks. But a, a significant element of what we're doing is also trying to figure out how we give the students the structure around that, how they actually feel part of a community, how they get things in the right order, how they, they feel that they're engaging in things. They have the, the option to actually interact with the lecturers and so on. So we need to find new ways to build that in. Maybe there are ways that do that as well as a traditional lecture, but just replacing a lecture with a bunch of videos really doesn't do that. But you talk about how lectures are structured and usually they're pre-structured. They're not just being done on the fly. If they've already been prepared and all the slides are prepared or all the things that are going to be written on the blackboard are prepared and what's going to be said is being prepared, why do you need to be in the room and why does they need to be why does Mike Merrifield need to be telling me this stuff that's written in his notes can't you you could get a robot to do it so interestingly I mean from the lecturer's perspective it's interesting that when I'm giving a lecture I I can tell when people aren't understanding what I'm saying you know you get that hum from the room you get the the board looks from the students you get little bits of conversation happening so actually as a lecturer I get pretty immediate feedback on, you know, on a case by case basis, you know, I can give the same lecture two years in a row. One year I explain something really well and everyone's happy with it. The next year, for whatever reason, it doesn't go across quite so well. And I become aware of that. And so actually I can adjust what I'm doing on the fly. I can back up. Um, I can, you know, make sure that I really am putting things across. And also bear in mind, you know, lectures isn't just me standing up for an hour. We have some levels of interaction. You know, we have we give the students these little clickers that allow them to answer questions during the course of the lecture. So there is sort of even in a large lecture with 200 students in it, I am getting that feedback. Did that thing I just explained go across right or have I failed to explain it miserably, in which case they're not going to be able to answer this simple, you know, multiple choice question I've just asked them. So there are lots of places where there is interaction, even in the conventional lecture. Now, some you know, the other sort of argument against conventional lectures is there are better ways to use those live sessions, right? That actually um, there is this thing called the flipped classroom, which is the idea is that basically in the classroom, instead of the lecturer standing up and teaching things, the students have pre-read a bunch of stuff. And then basically you get them to solve problems in the class. You get them to interact with you, to interact with each other and get much more of a dialogue going. It's a nice idea in principle. Uh, it, work, it clearly works to a degree, but actually there is interesting evidence that suggests it's not quite the golden bullet that some people have been arguing that it is. That actually, so there have been there was a test done last year uh, by some researchers at MIT where they did the controlled experiment of some people being taught in a flipped classroom way, some people being taught in a conventional way. They found that the overall attainment was about the same in both groups, but actually the flipped classroom group, the spread of attainment was much bigger in that the better students really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it and did better, but the weaker students really struggled with it. And for example, students from minority groups found it very hard. And in retrospect, I think there are kind of obvious reasons for that, right? That actually you would expect that if you're a, a slightly disenfranchised group, if you come up with a way of teaching that really requires you to interact effectively with the other students, then you're going to find it harder to do if you're, they're not your natural social peer group that you've been interacting with anyway. So I think, you know, part of the argument against the traditional lecture is that there are newer, better ways of doing it. I would just caution that those newer, better ways sometimes have some some shortcomings of their own. And we just got to tread carefully here. We can't throw away a thousand years of lecturing just because something newer and shinier has come along without giving it a lot of careful thought. Mark, you were educated via lectures in your university life. What's your memory of sitting through lectures? It was pretty varied. Um, I think, I mean, you know, part of my prejudice, as with everybody, right, part of my prejudice is, comes from my own experience. And my own experience is I needed that structure, right? I needed to know that I needed to be in a particular lecture theatre at a particular time and I would turn up even if I wasn't really feeling like doing it and I would engage with it and I'd take notes and all those things. If it had really been left up to me and I'd just been learning out of books at the time, I wouldn't have got anywhere because I just didn't have the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, the confidence to do that. Um, just the motivation it's not motivation I was just I just it's just not the way my mind works right I'm I guess I'm intrinsically lazy and if you don't give me a structure to learn in um, then I'll find other things to do 
are there students that slip through the gaps because of lectures though? They can just sit in the back corner for 45 minutes or not turn up at all and not learn anything. That would be true if lecturing was the only thing we did, right? But actually we have tutorials, we meet with the students on a regular basis, we have problem classes where we get them to solve problems and see how they're managing with that. So there are lots of other places and ways in which we interact with students. So I think, you know, I certainly wouldn't argue that lectures are the only way that students should learn, the only medium, the only technique that we should be using, but I think they're kind of part of our arsenal and one that we should keep. Are lectures exciting or boring? <laughs> Depends on the lecturer. <laughs> Yeah. And the lecture. I know it's interesting, right? Some of my colleagues, you know, sometimes they end up with what look like deadly dull subjects to lecture, but they find exciting ways to present them. Others sometimes look like they've got the most exciting optional thing that will, you know, tell people about cutting edge research in some area or other. And they manage to sound it, make it sound deadly dull. Um, so it, it, it is a bit varied. I just don't think you improve that situation dramatically by just changing the medium you're using for teaching. What makes a really good lecture? I wish I knew, because if I knew that, I'd do it every time. And it really is, you know, it, it can be on two successive days, I can give two successive lectures, and one of them I come away with a real buzz because it's gone really well, and the next day I can come away feeling really flat that I just didn't explain that well. And it, there's, I can't, I've never been able to identify what the magic ingredient is that makes it go well. What do you say to someone who says, well, Mike's the head of school at a university physics department, of course he's going to advocate for something that, you know, you can only get at a university. Um, I, I mean, that, is that a true statement? I guess that is a true statement. I mean, it's true to an extent, uh, and there are people who are perfectly, you know, autodidacts who can go out and really learn these things on their own. I think probably the learning process intrinsically requires somebody to be guiding you through it. And whether that guidance comes from a lecturer standing at the front of a lecture theatre or a tutor you're chatting with about your problems at trying to, to understand a particular area of the subject, you know, there will be different ways that that guidance is given. The lecture is just one of the ways that that guidance is given. I also think there's like a little bit of star power in a strange way to being taught in person by a person who does the thing and knows the stuff. Even if it's a lowly astronomer being taught, be, being taught astronomy by someone who's been there and done it and done real astronomy and written papers and used the big telescopes has like a kind of a, a star quality, if you excuse the pun. And also it means that, you know, when they come up with questions at the end that weren't on the syllabus, hopefully it means the lecturer can actually answer them because, you know, they actually know the subject. They, they don't ju just know the thing that they're teaching. They don't just know the syllabus they're teaching. They actually know the subject around it. And that's really where you want to be getting to in higher education, right? You don't want people rote learning a syllabus. You want them exploring that syllabus and pushing it into new areas. And having somebody who actually studies the subject doing that is the only way that you can facilitate that because you don't want to get to a situation where you are, come up to the lecturer at the end of a lecture and ask them a question and they're, the only answer they can give is, I don't know, that's not on the syllabus. One last question. You having made the case for lectures and talking about how valuable you think they are to education, we're recording this during a pandemic where it looks like you're not going to be able to give them for who knows how long. How catastrophic is that? So we really are, you know, the process has been nonstop in that we moved all our teaching very rapidly online in a very ad hoc fashion when it all started. We then got into assessment. How do we do exams? We figured out ways of doing that. We've just completed the assessment. We've just been returning the students their marks. The next thing on the list is, OK, so that's done. Now, how do we teach it better next year? So we're already I was in a, a Skype meeting yesterday where we were discussing new methods for teaching, what technology we're going to use, what approaches we're going to use, how we're going to split things up into smaller pieces, how we're going to ensure that there are, you know, Q&A sessions with lecturers and ways for them to engage with the lecturer. We're only working our way through that now. Hopefully, you know, this is not the final solution, right? This is not the long term where we're going to be forever. And so we're trying to develop things in a way that's sort of blended, that allows us to combine face-to-face -face things with online things so that we can shift the balance as times allow. Um, but we're really just feeling our way through it at the moment. Quote, which is, the traditional lecture involves transferring the notes from the notebook of the lecturer to the notebooks of the students without going through the brains of either. And that might be overstating the case a little bit, but it's not overstating the case a lot.